years. Um, last time I was here was about three or four years ago when I did the keynote, which was kind of cool. And also, I'd like to welcome you um, to Santa Barbara County, um, which is a fabulous place. I know you've seen a bit of it, and I hope you all get a chance to uh, drive around, maybe get out to the Santa Rita Hills and Santa Maria Valley and San Ynez Valley. And I think some of you were out at Happy Canyon. Yeah? Yes. So this is a gorgeous, wonderful place, and uh, I'm glad you're here. So we, we have a fairly compact uh, agenda today. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, briefly, I am Steve Heimoff. I started writing about wine for myself in the late 80s, just as a hobby, because I really loved wine. And then I went to Wine Spectator at a time when, let's face it, nobody wanted to be a wine writer in the late 80s. So it wasn't that hard to do that. And then I ended up an enthusiast for 23 years. And as some of you may know, this past March, I happily and proudly uh, took my job at Jackson Family. Um, so that's pretty much me. Can we get rid of whatever radio or... Is that you? Somebody's paging Robert's one line dudes. <laughs> It must be God. God was calling it. Joe Roberts. So I'm going to give the mic to Joe Roberts. Um, great guy. You all know him. I met Joe through uh, the Bloggers Conference, and he's a great guy. Hello. Try and live up to that. Wow. I'm Joe Roberts. I have a blog called OneWineDude.com. So uh, that's, that's kind of the extremely short version of why I'm here. So uh, I started that as just an avid consumer in, I think, about 07 or so. Uh, went completely off the deep end. And for some reason, the blog got popular and, and sort of stayed that way. And it allowed me to bootstrap my way into the wine world. So now I do wine media full-time. And uh, essentially, I would say I'm a freelance wine guy. And I did get asked, well, what do you do? Because you, know, you can't possibly be doing this full-time. I said, yes, I can. And this is what I do. So I get to do what you're looking at right here. That's, yeah, it's the coolest job, like, ever. <laughs> yeah, I always need an intern. Somebody just asked for openings. Always need an intern. You must be able to lift, like, two cases of wine at a time. And, uh, <laughs> so now I taste uh, maybe not as many wines as Steve did in his, his critical heyday with wine enthusiasts, but probably pretty close. It's several thousand wines a year. I have the cavities and the gum grafts and all that stuff to prove it. And, uh, you know, yes, this stuff will ruin, ruin your mouth, especially if you have bad genes uh, up there like I do. Uh, and I, I suppose that's in, in some ways why, also why I'm here in front of you today. T tooth care is important <laughs> in, in, in this show. Now, we are supposed to have Patrick Comiskey as this guy. You will notice that the chair is empty. So apparently Patrick has found himself in that infamous L.A. to Santa Barbara traffic. And we expect him here, perhaps momentarily, but um, so we don't really have a full thing. So Joe and I decided that in the interim we'll both do a little stand-up comedy. <laughs> and since we both have martial arts backgrounds, we're going to give you all a little demonstration that may the best man win. <laughs> And one, one of the things I, I like about him is before we met at, at Wine Bloggers five, six years ago, um, he blogged on it in advance, and I was going to be there too, and he said, he said, I hope Steve Heimoff kicks my ass. And I thought, that's really cool, because it's nice to have a little fun, you know. So anyway, without further ado, and when, when Patrick does show up, we'll just launch into an intro of him. Um, so we're going to have, assuming Patrick shows up, we're going to have 35 minutes, I think, of, uh, we've done the intro. So I'm just going to start. I'm going to take about five, six, seven minutes and answer some of these, uh, touch some of these issues here. Um, so we are being asked by the organizers to tell you, to help understand what a critic looks for when we taste. So you want to share that? I'll start. You, you do that too? 
So what do we look for? Well, I guess, you know, the obvious answer is we look for what is in the glass, right? So you're not supposed to bring your expectation or anything. You're supposed to have like a blank Zen kind of mind. And uh, so you're not really looking for anything. Um, in a certain way of experience, obviously, you're looking for aroma and visual effects and, and flavor. But um, that's all I would say is I'm looking for the wine in the glass to tell me whatever it wants to say. Joe? I, it's interesting you bring that up. I, that's the sh much shorter summary than I expected, so now I feel completely unprepared. We have a lot of ground to cover. I, yeah, I think in some ways it's extremely important uh, not to let your own expectations take over immediately. Everybody's guilty of that at some point. And when you taste a lot of wines, especially in succession, you will hit that point. Either you'll, you'll hit fatigue, you'll hit mental fatigue, something, where you realize that you're, you're prejudging, essentially. And at that point, you have to be able to, to cut and run. Like, you have to stop. Your day's over. Sometimes it happens sooner, sometimes that, you know, later. Uh, but it, it, it absolutely does happen. Um, I think way too much about this topic. Can I just tell Like, probably bizarrely obsessive amounts about this topic in terms of ratings, scores, the process, etc. But what I thought might be uh, most useful was talking about kind of the stages of the process that I think unhealthily, you know, too much about with everybody. Is that, are you okay with that if I, if I go into that? Okay. So I know everyone's tortured because they're like, oh my God, there's these wines in front of us. What are they going to taste this? So uh, I actually think there, there, for me, there are three stages of tasting anal in an analytical way or in a critical way. And the first stage is very, very analytical. So if anybody, you, you can't unknow what I'm about to tell you so, or about to do. So if anybody doesn't want the joy of wine sucked out of their life temporarily, you should get up and leave right now. I mean, it will come back at the end, but for like a couple minutes... I'm gonna. I, I am literally. I'm gonna destroy it, because um, essentially, when you, what I do when I first hit a wine is, uh, has anyone heard of the systematic tasting method, WSET? Anybody certified? A lot of people could. I mean, that's actually more than probably what a lot of a lot of critics probably have. And don't have that kind of background, where the, the Wine Spirits Education Trust teaches a very uh, systematic way of going through a wine. And that's essentially what I do. And the more you do it, the faster it can, your brain can process and your taste buds can process that. But essentially it's, okay, what do we think it is? How much acid is there? Um, what, kind of, um, what kind of winemaking procedures do you think happened? Uh, how, it could depend on right, how much oak, how much fruit, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's, it's ex basically you're, I try to become a mini tasting robot. Put it in, determine how much I think of those certain qualities are there. I'm not necessarily concerned about what they're doing, if they're interacting together, uh, how harmonious they are, don't care. At that, I'm, I'm just looking for, does it have flaws? Um, if, if it's a variety, do I think it's varietally correct in how it's presenting itself? How strong are the aromas? How many are there? Um, how strong are the flavors? How many are there? How persistent are the flavors and the finish? How many are there? Uh, how does it feel as it goes from kind of one stage to the other? Hits your tongue all the way back, spit it out, and how, um, how long is that going on? What is happening in each of the stages? Are any of them clunky? Are any of them smooth? Uh, texturally, what's going on in the wine? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, everyone's like, oh. God, it sounds like math. Yeah, I mean, that's, and it, it sucks. I mean, that part, if you want to do it on a professional level, that's the sucky part that you have to, you, you just have to swallow that pill and do it. Well, let's say that a little later. So, you know, we, we all taste, I think, fundamentally the same way. I mean, there, there's only so many things you can do. You don't put it in your ear. You know, you don't stick your nose in it or anything like that. You look at it for clarity and stuff like that. Um, you smell it for whatever that conveys to you. 
you taste it, and hopefully you spit. Not everybody always does. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, he mentioned, Joe mentioned WSET, and when I started, we didn't have these things, right? I guess they had MW, and that was never the path that I chose. So when I started, um, the way that I learned to taste was by reading um, Michael Broadbent has a wonderful little handbook, and I still have it. And it was a fabulous book, I can't remember the name, but you know, it was the classic British way, the way that the trade, the British wine trade, invented wine tasting as we know it, like hundreds of years ago. And he just, and all those Brits like Michael Broadbent and Hugh Johnson and Harry Walk, they all came out of the trade, don't forget. So there's, a, a, it, it's, Nice to know the history of what we do, and it does have its roots in the British wine trade. And later, when we talk about blind tasting, we will understand how this weird concept of tasting a wine from a paper bag came to be. It came to be from the British wine trade. So, you know, I just learned in a very simple and elementary way that three-step process of eye, nose, and then palate. Um, and uh, when I went to Wine Spectator, that's how they tasted. So I pretty much taste the same way that I've been tasting for 30 plus years. Um, and you know, it's not rocket science. You just do it. You do it a lot. The more you do it, the better you get at it. It's like riding a bicycle or a skateboard or anything. You, you learn how to keep your balance. Um, I used to do a lot of wines at once, and Joe referred to the fatigue factor, and I think that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, the, the further along I got in this, um, the more I realized that it's really not a good idea for me to taste a boatload of wine at a time, because you do get tired. Your, your palate gets tired even if you're spinning, it's osmosing through the mucous membranes, and I don't care what you say, and I remember a couple of years ago, I ran into Bologna, and I said, how many wines a day do you taste? And he said, 250, 300, and I'm like, what? And he said, he actually gets stronger at the end than at the beginning. And that led to a conversation, and this is important, it really is, about how to stay in shape. Okay, we, we referred to the teeth a little bit, but you know, you have to be, I think, physically strong and in good shape to do this job. So to me now, well, I'm not an enthusiast anymore, but the last number of years, my maximum per day was 15. And I, I think that it just wasn't fair to the wine, to my, to my health, to the magazine, to taste more than that. So, you know, you guys can do your speed tweeting and stuff like that. Not sure I kind of approve. But, we'll get into this later too, is one of the things I'm really going to want to point out later, is that there are different wine jobs. Mm -hmm. Each one of you, if you do hope to be paid to be in this you know, profession, each one of you is going to have a different job. And depending on your job, it's going to require a different method of tasting. So just you know, keep that in mind, there's no one size fits all. Hey Joe, you want to give a, what have we covered, um, provide a framework for your own tasting. Where do you taste, uh, what time of the day, give us all that good stuff. Well, before I get into that, I do want to mention there's like a second phase, because I, I, I can't leave these people on the shores of despair, uh, you're a robot tasting. Um, one of the things you just talked about with that fatigue, it kind of, it, it creates a bit of a paradox, because for me, there's a second phase of tasting, it's comparative. So what you're looking for is, okay, is this wine taste like varieties from that where I think it's from? Um, if not, was that the intention of the winemaker? Um, where does it sit on a quality level, you know, from really terrible wine to best wines in the world for that variety, even in general across all wines? And the only way to do that is to have a a very broad and deep experience level, which is why, I, I mean, I get asked a lot, hey, do you have any advice on wine blogging? I say, yeah, don't review wines. 
what do you mean don't review wines? I said, because I'd love to take the first year where I even did ratings or whatever and throw it all out. Because I don't think it would, I just didn't have the experience level. Now it doesn't mean you shouldn't write about wines and, and what they mean to you, you should. It's, that's awesome. But in terms of just reviewing it, I mean, look, I'm not gonna call a 15 year old boy you know, for relationship advice. I'm just not going to do that. He just doesn't know. He just doesn't. He might, he might be taller than me, but he doesn't have the, the requisite experience. And so, if you're just starting out, you just there's almost no way you're going to have the breadth and the depth to make a meaningful determination in that kind of comparative phase. But then, I, but then the last phase, well, the last phase though, is the for me is emotional. That's does the wine move me? And now, sorry, that's what I'm saying. It's like we can bring it back. It doesn't have to be completely robotic and all despair, uh, because. That's where the passionate part comes from, and when they may not be the best wine in the world, but when you really love it, and you tell I really love this wine that I picked that we'll get into soon, I hope, um, that passion really comes through. And I think that's where the citizen bloggers, you know, that's where we have, that's where our strength really lies right now, that last section. You know, I just want to say what, on piggybacking on what he said, he, everyone has to start someplace, right? And I... I think Joe will remember some years ago when, um, you know, when, when, when he started, I thought he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> let's, let, let's face it. But I'll tell you something that what the, the first time when I started at Wine Spectator, the first time they invited me into the inner sanctum where the tasting is going on, right? And somebody's sitting there at the computer determining the number, right? And I'm like in awe. And I remember we were tasting white burgundy. And I remember looking at these guys, and they're all still there, because Wine Spectator hangs on to its employees for a long time. And I remember looking at them and going like, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. They're giving ratings and reviews to these wines, and they're as ignorant as I am. And, you know, but it wasn't scandalous, because I was thinking like, well, they still know more than their readers. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know, you, you have to start with where you start. You can't wait and be an MW or something like that. So I, I encourage people, you know. I've been reading a lot of the submissions that, that some of you have been writing, these 500-word essays. And, you know, I mean, maybe some of those reviews are a little wacko to me. But, but they're starting. You're starting, you know, and you develop a vocabulary and that kind of stuff. Um, I guess we should go into the wines, because we have three wines. Hopefully Patrick will show up. Um, so, do you want to talk about your wine? Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I have a question. I know Joe's opinion, because he's pretty vocal on our board, basically, about the issue of wine tasting and judging. Right. Um, my question is, it has to do with when we know the wine. How are you able to put aside any um, inherent bias? Well, that's a good question, and I will, I will tell you that I know pretty much all the critics, and I have never met a critic who did not say that they felt themselves perfectly capable of being objective no matter what, whether they knew the wine or not. I'm, I'm, now, he says no way. I'm just saying every critic will tell you that they do not feel they're biased by knowing it. Don't forget, Parker tastes openly. His whole team tastes openly. But Steve Tanzer tastes openly. But as so. a human being, you have like an inherent bias. I mean, that's what marketers live off of, and that's why they try and use colors and sights and pictures and sounds. And that's true. And things, so how do you deal but with that? But if you, if you, you can look at it you know, from the other point of view and say, let's say, you know, you're, you're, the very fame of the wine can work against it if it lets you down, if you feel that it's not really what you expected, you know, truce or whatever to taste like. So in the end, and I figured this out a long time ago, for me, okay, I figured there is no best way to do this game of tasting. Um, and like I said a little earlier, it depends on your job. You know, if you're a sommelier, at a white tablecloth restaurant, you have a totally different job than if you're working for Kermit Lynch in Berkeley selling wine, which is totally different from Steve being wine enthusiast or um, 
or someone, you know, doing PR or whatever. There's just different ways, and you have to figure out the way that works best for you. I, I do not believe open, double-blind, single-blind. Nothing is better than anything else. They serve different purposes. They're tools. I, I'd agree with that. And I, this is going to sound weird, but interesting for me, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm almost entirely tasting samples, right? And because I didn't pay for them, a lot of times that context doesn't mean a whole lot to me. So I actually like to know just about everything I can about a wine, with the exception of other people's ratings, if they've already reviewed it. Um, and what, what I find is when I taste blind, it's awesome for me to discover my own preferences or discover producers who I might otherwise have checked out to buy for my personal pleasure, which suggests that me, for me, tasting blind, it actually is too subjective. I, I fall back too much on my own personal preferences. And that really bugs me. When I realized that, I was like, oh my God, okay, we're gonna, I have to stop tasting blind until I can figure this out. So I don't, right now I don't taste wines blind unless it's like competition or, or something similar. So we should go on to the wines. Is that cool? Yeah. Okay. Man, I hope Comiskey shows up. I really do. Because I don't have the hair on Ted um, well, so, are you the, uh... Oh, 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 oh. Patrick, welcome. How are you feeling? Oh, really relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, goatee got longer. You want some belly? maximum. Um, and the fourth wine is a mystery wine, and we'll talk about that later. So, Joe. So the, the reason I picked this wine is because I love it. And so I thought, well, I could do something that's a little more standard and be very analytical, but I figured no one was going to get Corsican Vermentino at the Wine Bloggers Conference in Santa Barbara. Uh, but also because I wanted to then kind of reconnect that to that more subjective emotional side. So this is not, I am almost never going to rate this wine. It's, it's, it's just not the kind of wine that's probably ever going to be A plus, you know, in a way to me, like, you know, beyond all, think, oh my God, there's no way this wine is, is perfection itself. But there's, a, you know, I can think of dozens and dozens and dozens of complex, you know, big, um, amazingly well-made a, you know, quote unquote, a like bombastic big red wines that I've thought I've been wowed by that I would, I would, I would much rather drink this than those wines. So I wanted to reconnect it to something a little more personal. And I got exposed to these with Kermit Lynch, like personally with him, uh, when I, when I interviewed him a few years ago and that was fun because he doesn't do a lot of interviews or didn't at the time anyway. And, we had, to, we had to wake him up. Unless he has a book to promote. Yeah, unless he has a book to promote. And, sorry, Kermit. And uh, that's all right. He won't watch this. He's, he's not online much, right? <laughs> but uh, I, love, I love, you know, what, what he stands for as well, kind of do your thing and, and you don't, don't change it and 40 years later it becomes cool again. So, um, I mean, to me, it's just, a, it's just an interesting, complex wine. Um, to get a little analytical, you're going to get some familiar, I think, citric fruit flavors, but then you're also going to get this kind of weird, toasty, nutty Vermentino thing coming out of it. 
um, you're going to get some wet stone kind of stuff coming out of it. And it, it, you know, fairly high acid, but not without textural depth on the palate. But, that, yeah, okay, that's geeky and all analytical. Uh, in terms of that, that middle range for me, it's very classic in terms of the variety of Vermentino. They, they set the standard in terms of Corsican white, so that's an easy one to say. It's typical of that, that area. Uh, but just emotionally, I love this wine. I mean, I could drink this wine all day long. I'm probably not going to spit it. Okay, I probably what, spit. Do, what do you mean um, emotionally? What does that mean? Well, that's, yeah, you're going to put me on the spot. Um, you know, it's, it's, one, it's, it's a subjective thing. It's, I like, I like tension, I personally like tension in wines. And sometimes that comes off as a wine that's completely schizophrenic, like it doesn't know what it wants to be. It's got ripe flavors here, but green notes there, and you know, will they come together, I don't know. Uh, this wine is one of those wines that to me achieves a tension that, that goes into something that really becomes more complexity. So there's vibrancy, there's acidic bite, there's citric pith, pithiness to that wine, love that word. Uh, but there's, a, there's a, a, a denseness on the palate and a fruity depth to it. And I love that tension. I love the, you know, I don't, I don't know if all the main characters are going to live through the story. You know what I mean? There's like a tiny bit of like darkness to the, to the tail of that wine, as vibrant as it is. Uh, and there's so, you know, it's just to me, speaks a little, on the emotional side, it's like a little tragic comedy, you know, in a glass. And I love that. What is the alcohol, if you happen to know? And just very quickly, there's a bottle over there. Can someone look at the, at the label? Crawl under the table again. I can crawl. And and just as long as we're on that topic, very quickly, maybe Patrick can then then Patrick can do his thing. What what is your take on this whole uh, alcohol level thing in pursuit of balance and and that whole thing? Very quickly. Sure. Uh, I think. Dismissing any particular aspect of a wine um, on its face without tasting it and experiencing it is a red, total red herring. Uh, and look, I, I'm all for balance and harmony in wines. That's a key factor to where you put it on the quality scale, you know, from worst to best. But there are plenty of very, you know, alcoholic wines that, I mean, look, we there are fortified wines that achieve incredible balance and they're... 20, 19, 20 percent by definition. So, uh, to me, that's a—it's just a wild goose chase. It's gonna go, all it's going to do is is make things a little bit more divisive than they probably need to be. I'm not—I'm not blasting in pursuit of balance. I love their wine, the wines they pick. I'm just saying there's room enough for both. Yeah. Well, well said. So, Patrick. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about my wine, the wine I selected, which is the Poet's Leap Riesling from 2013. And I'm going to just start by, I'm not going to talk about the wine, uh, the wine's characteristics just yet. I want to talk about some of the many reasons that I selected this wine. Do, do you all know who Patrick is? Can we get a little bit of Sure. What's that, Wilbur? Who am I? <laughs> Patrick Kamiski. I'm a wine writer. I've been, I've been uh, on the masthead at Wine and Spirits magazine for uh, since 2000. Uh, I have been the critic for all of the wines not from California, uh, domestic wines that is, um, since 2003. And so I've gotten to know the Northwest in particular and Finger Lakes, Missouri, and a number of other places quite well over the years, and that is one of the many reasons that I selected this wine, but let me talk a little bit more, some, some other reasons. First of all, Wine and Spirits tastes everything blind, except that we have an appellation and a vintage uh, when we approach the wine. So I know that this, if I'm tasting this wine blind, I know this much about it. It's from 2013, it's from the Columbia Valley, Columbia Valley is 12.4 million acres, so it's going to be hard to narrow it down. But um, I'm, going to, I'm going to have a pretty good idea of what to expect. The second thing I know is that Riesling in Washington State is resurgent. It is, uh, it is a variety that has been there since the early 60s, but uh, which fell into kind of disrepair 
and uh, was ignored over other mostly red varieties like Merlot and eventually Syrah and Cabernet. Um, but in the early aughts, it was rekindled. Interestingly, it was rekindled primarily because of some strategic partnerships that people from the Saint, Saint Michel camp established with German producers, not just any German producers, but Ernst Lucen. Uh, and Ernie Lucen is one of the great Riesling producers in the world, or in the Mosul, ergo in the world. And so, uh, so suddenly everyone had to be, had to say, "Oh God, if he thinks this is good, I guess we better take a look at it." And some some renewed interest in the in the wines of Washington were established in that moment. Um, Washington, broadly speaking, is very good. For Riesling terroir in certain places, it is, as you probably know, a very warm region, but it has remarkably cool autumns. And that cool, the, the cool nights and long hang times for Riesling, particularly in higher elevations and closer to the Cascade Mountains, uh, you get a very, very, a, a really delightful um, conditions terroir for uh, Washington, even though, of course, it does resemble the Mosul Valley, not a bit, right? Um, for all that, again, we're looking at this wine as if I'm approaching it blind. The things that I've come to look for and appreciate in Washington State Riesling in this day and age, um, in a word, I'm looking for purity. Purity is this rather elusive and fairly esoteric concept that nevertheless is a thing that I see over and over and over again in the great Rieslings from Washington State. This one is made great for yet another association with a German winemaker, in this case, Armand Deal, and his daughter, as, as a matter of fact, Carolyn. Um, Armand Deal is the Ernie Lucen of the Nea. <laughs> where uh, and he is he is also a great great winemaker and so once again you have to take notice you have to sit up and take notice now I've been talking about this wine for five minutes so far I've only scratched the surface and I haven't even tasted it yet but this is what I'm bringing to the wine and this these are the storylines that I can connect to this wine when I come to write my tasting note and when I come to establish where this, this wine is coming from. Uh, where do I go from here? Next, go proceed, please. So just as I asked Joe to explain uh, emotional, define purity. <clears throat> um, Riesling is a very transparent variety. Um, and when transparency, transparency meets windblown lust, as is the case with, with most of the soils where Riesling is planted in Washington State, you get this beautiful white space. You get this void, but you also get this sort of, this hint of clarity. I think, I look at Washington Rieslings, and I don't, at first pass, I do not think of flavors, I think of qualities of light. And that's partly because Washington has the most amazing light in the Pacific Northwest because at this, you know, on this evening it's, the sun is going to set at 9.30, um, but also because it has, there is an angularity of light that I'm going to strain to find in the glass. That is fairly abstract, I grant you, but it is still something that I endeavor to do as a writer, as a poet of wine, so, so to speak. Um, these are the things that I'm looking for. So I hope that comes to comes to answer your question a little bit. Um, what I did about this, what I did when I did taste this wine about a month ago in Washington State, I actually toured one of the vineyards where this wine is grown, uh, the benches overlooking the Columbia River, one of the most spectacular, uh, uh, certainly the most spectacular vineyard in Washington State that I've seen. Uh, extraordinary place. I want to quickly read my raw notes on this wine from a month ago, and then 
maybe a little bit later, I'll come back to the line and give you a tasting note based on those raw notes. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. So my raw note is initially said brilliant in the glass, lemon thyme, green, and bright herb scents, high-toned white peach with a very pleasing phenolic note in the aroma, palate flavors of a German minerality. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, that I don't normally associate with Washington. And that, so that's interesting. And it kind of contributes to the wine's complexity. Um, it is this wine, and this, this, I did not taste this wine, so I, I had a context here. This is a racier wine than in years past. It has beautiful, rippling acidity. And to come back to that notion of, of German minerality, it had a kind of slatiness at the time that I found to be very appealing and I decided was Germanic. So, I think that's all I have to say. Now taste it. <laughs> if anyone has any comments on anything so far, just shout out. What are the prices on the two wines you've tasted so far? This wine's 20 bucks. Yeah. I think it's about, I want to say 30, 35 for Patrick, do you want to talk at all about the I can read it for you, but I don't particularly care. Um, no, I mean, not, not the number, but in terms of why, what's the whole deal about, why do we like Rieslings that have a little bit of sweetness, as opposed to bone dry the way we're like so and something like that? Um, I think the simplest answer to that question is balance, and that is, um, if I had gotten here on time, I would have talked a little bit about what wine and spirits um, looks for in a wine, and I think that, that on the top of its list is balance. So in a Riesling, the acidity levels can be extremely searing, and so you need some residual sugar to mollify that impression of sharpness and give the wine a little bit of body, where otherwise it would just some, be somewhat abrasive on the Philly boy, Philly boy is asking. Uh, so if I taste the three stages and I try to be as objective as possible in the first, and then it's very emotional in the later, so how do you restrain that? And the answer is you can't, 100%. And yeah, Steve's so saying you don't have to. I, I think you do, um, like I think you need to, you do need to rein it in because uh, just because I love Cru Beaujolais doesn't mean it, they should be like A plus wines. Do you know what I mean? Because a lot of them, as great as they are, they just, they're not going to have that kind of depth and complexity, even though I love to drink them. Just as an example, and I recommend everybody drink them. That would have been my second choice for a wine today, for sure. Um, so I think you, you just have to have an internal meter of when you are, you know, going into that realm. Uh, where, whether it's really bad. I mean, I've had some amazing wines that I was just like, I can't drink this. Uh, I don't like this wine, I don't like the amount of oak on it, whatever, whatever. But you can't, in some ways, if you have that middle piece of how, how broad and deep your experience is, you, and Patrick talked about this, you can bring those contexts to it very quickly, and that, I think, helps you, uh, helps you pull that back. Um, you know, that's a good question. I just want to add that if, if you read um, good critics, right, like Parker, Tanzer, people like that, if they get really enthusiastic and emotional about a wine, they fold that into the review. And I think that, you know, when we taste wine, we're not tasting it just for the sake of tasting it. There's an end product that has to come out of that, whether it's a placement on a wine list or a magazine review or your, your blog or whatever. And I think it's great to get emotional. I think what Joe was saying, and we'd all agree with it, 
is first you do your analytics, and then if it's really all there, then you can really let your mind blow. You know, I mean, Parker says something, you know, like dazzling. I mean, dazzling is not really a scientific word, okay? But, you know, but he conveys that this wine elevated my heart and, and my soul. And I think that that, I hate reviews that are just, you know, acidity, oak was, you know, medium plus char. How do you do a follow up? How do you do the opposite? And then you don't say it elevates your heart. <laughs> I mean, it's like anything else. You just keep it, tell the truth. So the code the co word for wine and spirits on that matter is needs time. <laughs> <laughs> so so what, what value is there, if any, in giving a, a negative review? One that does, neither elevates your heart and neither fulfills these analytical qualities. Okay, well, let's have each of us very quickly way in because we have two more wines, okay? Um, I guess that I don't really like negative reviews, but again, we're products of our employers at Wine Enthusiasts. They don't break, they don't publish anything below 80 points. And the theory is that, you know, why kick a man when he's already down? Spectator, I don't know how old they go, I think in the 50s, right? And, and we can argue about if that's fair or appropriate or whatever. Joe? I, I try to reserve that space now for wines I think need to be kicked in the crotch for some reason. I mean, basically because I think they're ripping people off. I mean, that, and that's it. So if you see like a really negative, I can't remember the last like D rating or whatever, but I've had a few and it's, I mean, some of them I had conversations with the winemaker and even after that I was like, they don't care. And so they need to be taken to task. Yeah. Especially if it costs 800 bucks. Patrick, very, very quickly on bad score. Well, I'd, I'd echo uh, what Joe said primarily. We don't. We tend not to go much lower than 83 or so. Um, th there's there's use value in an 85. I, I we kind of we we spend a little bit of time trying to recapture that so that it is actually a quality score for a twelve dollar wine. An 87 is pretty pretty not so bad. So and that's a that's a wine I'd want to drink. Um, I, I also, but I also agree with Joe a little bit that that when someone needs a kick in the pants, they deserve it. They, I don't go. No, none of us go so far, as far as the spectator, um, which can frequently resemble hubris. But um, but in the in, but in in most cases, if a wine is overvalued or is or there is no there there, we're going to say something. Okay. Thank you. Um, well. If you will turn your attention to wine number three, which is the Cambria Cone 4 Pinot Noir from 2011 Vintage. And I'm just going to, I got some things I want to say about Cambria, just to let you know a little bit more about what's in front of you. So, um, the, the wine comes from Cambria's Julia's Vineyard, um, which is in the Santa Maria Valley. Will people please raise their hands if you feel like you have a pretty solid understanding of Santa Maria Valley? So, maybe one-fifth of the audience. Uh, Santa Maria Valley is one of the Appalachians here in Santa Barbara County. I don't think you're getting there on this trip. Could be wrong. It's worth a visit. Um, Cam the Cambria Vineyard is literally adjacent next door to Bien Nacido. How many people have heard of Bien Nacido? Yeah, lots, right? Great vineyard, right? Santa Maria Valley, great place. Um, the Clone 4 is also known as the Pomard Clone, which means it's not one of the newer, they're not new anymore, the D. Johns, they started coming in in the late 80s, 667, 115, 777, you've all heard of those guys, right? And the Pomard uh, really was, the cuttings were brought over from the commune of Pomard in, in Burgundy, in the Cote de Bone. So people often say, and I agree, that they find more Burgundian elements in a Clone for Pinot Noir, such as mushrooms, or instead of bright raspberry cherry fruit like you get in so many of the Dijon clones, you get maybe earthier things like rhubarb or pomegranate and things like that. 
Um, of course, since California is so much further south than Burgundy, you can't turn our sun off. So even with those Burgundian notes, you are going to get that raspberry cherry thing. Um, another thing I want to tell you about this wine is, and I'm, I'm kind of proud of this, is the Julia, after which the vineyard is named, is Jess Jackson's daughter, Julia Jackson. And um, she has started a charity called Seeds of Empowerment, which awards grants to strong women around the world who are making a difference. And Seeds of Empowerment has joined forces with a, an organization uh, called, uh, give me a second here, Vital Voices, which Hillary Clinton is uh, a force behind. And Seeds of Empowerment and Vital Voices are going to be going there around the world doing fundraising to raise money for these strong women, whether they're doing hospitals or shelter or things like that. And the official line of that, which will be poured around the world at all these fundraising, is the Clone 4 Pinot Noir. And you guys are getting to taste it first, so I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. Um, you know, to me, it's just, it's a beautiful wine. It's very Santa Maria Valley. It's got that good acidity because Santa Maria Valley is a very cold place. If, if you've ever been there, uh, you know that the fog rolls in fiercely by whenever, 7 o'clock every night, hangs out all night long into the late morning, burns off to these beautiful, clear blue skies. And at this southerly latitude of Santa Barbara County, there's a lot of strong sunshine. So between, let's say, noon and 6, those grapes are getting that gorgeous solar radiation. And then the fog comes in and the temperature hits the low 50s. And that's your acidity. So um, I don't want to belabor all that, but to me, this is like a really, really classic Santa Maria Valley Pinot Noir. I think it can age a little bit. Wouldn't stick it away for 20 years or anything. Um, do you like it? Yeah. Well, yeah, to me, it's... Does anyone from Jackson in the room know the price point on the Clone 4? 5-2. Okay, so... Fairly expensive, but I don't know the case production. It is very, very tiny, okay? So it's hard to find, but um, it's just beautiful Pinot Noir. And the spicy, Joe mentioned the spicy. I had always associated Santa Maria Valley for many, many years. Santa Maria Valley uh, Pinot Noir with what I call crushed brown spice. Okay, so clove and cardamom and, and cinnamon and, and some black pepper and you always get that, but the Clone 4, I think, even elevates that because it is the original Burgundy clone, and it's actually a selection, and, and so you get even more spiciness, so I love that spiciness. This is a great barbecue wine.